Why are so many modern authors weak human beings, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually? And today, Yukio Mishima himself is going to speak at length on the virus of lunar writing. And if you've never heard of lunar writing before, it is a cornerstone of what Mishima fought against until the end of his life. And if you guys don't already know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to Yukio Mishima here on YouTube. If you look at the playlist down below, you will see an ever-blossoming library of videos on Mishima's life, his novels, and his philosophy. And here on Right Conscious, we are on a literary crusade and nocturnal thought and lunar writing only has a very small place in it. But when you look at the hellscape of the modern publishing industry, at the hellscape of what artists have become, then you will see the need to join in the solar rebellion of writing, of consciousness, and come into the, into the light and share your art with the world in a substantial an optical manner. But enough from me. Let us now hear from Mishima. And he's speaking on his early life as a writer and what he learned in this first quote. A hostility toward the sun was my only rebellion against the spirit of the age. I hankered after Novalis's night and Yeetzian Irish twilights. However, from the time the war ended, I gradually sensed that an era was approaching in which to treat the sun as an enemy would be tantamount to, the fo to following the herd. The literary works written or put before the public around that time were dominated by night thoughts, though their night was far less aesthetic than mine. To be really respected at that time, moreover, one's darkness had to be rich and cloying, not thin. Even the rich honeyed night in which I myself had wallowed in my boyhood seemed to them apparently very thin stuff indeed. Little by little, I began to feel uncertain about the night in which I had placed such trust during the war and to suspect that I might have belonged with the sun worshippers all along. It may well have been so. And if it was indeed so, I began to wonder, might not my persistent hostility towards the sun and the continued importance I attached to my own small private night be no more than a desire to follow the herd? And we have more from Mishima, but let me break down what he just said for a second, because some of you guys maybe haven't thought in a spiritual way, especially in regards to your own life and your own art in a lunar solar dichotomy. And when we look at our modern capitalistic culture, it is very solar. We are forced to go out into the world and do these things in a very ambitious manner. But when we look at our artistic world and what that's become and the leaders of thought in writing, movies, whatever, they are nocturnal and, and hidden little creatures. Because most artists today engage in two different types of art. They engage in horizontal art. And this is where like the pitiful stuff that we see in modern publishing come from. You look in horizontal art, you look horizontally at the world around you and the artists around you, and you write about that. And this is where we where a lot of the marginalized voices narratives and the first person point of view stuff and the book talk stuff comes from, or the confessional poetry. Like we, that may be more what we're about to talk about in a second, but it's horizontal art. And Robert Bly talked about this in a Western context and all the way back in the 1950s and 60s. And this, he was blowing the whistle just like Mishima, literally at the same time. I don't even think they knew about each other. And they, and they were saying, this is going to ruin art. This is going to be the end of us. This is why MFA programming programs and um, national endowment of arts programs that give money to individuals and let them be safe and live in their little hollow are dangerous because artists have to be on the cutting edge. They have to be out in the world actually, actually living. But men more so in recent years, really since the post-war era and a lot and women too, have also become obsessed with the vertical descent. Obviously, when we look at Carl Jung's philosophy, integrating the shadow is very important. But this is what I always say to people. I'm like, okay, you've integrated your shadow. Oh my God, you've done psychedelics and you've realized so much. Oh my God, or you love Jesus now or whatever. You've f figured out what's going to happen. So what? Now, what are you going to do? I don't care. No, it doesn't matter. If you've accumulated a ton of knowledge and you were doing nothing with it, maybe other than speaking to some of your friends at the bar and teaching your kids, then all of that is useless. Like, what's the point? You might as well have just grilled and chilled and done nothing. You were literally a Maserati that's never left the garage or only cruises around the neighborhood. But 
the depths are also now with confessional poetry and with memoirs talking about our problems and the exploration of addiction and sexual taboos and all these things. These are all heavy in nocturnal thinking and nocturnal art. But when we look back, oh, wow, that is important because that was all very much suppressed for a very long time because of Christianity and whatnot. But the people who engage with a nocturnal thought and um, even horizontal art and vertical uh, dissension, dissension art is important. And we all should have that in our tool bag and do it. But what are you doing art for in 2024? Is it just kind of a self-congratulatory thing where you, wow, you did it, you got published? Or are you actually trying to do something? Are you actually trying to create an educational or spiritual awakening in your reader, in the receiver of the art? You are the perceiver. How strong of a signal are you trying to send out? And what is your axiomatic reason for that? For the love of God. We already have enough art. There already have been enough movies and enough books created to get people to an art emotional, physical, spiritual, and intellectual baseline so that we can create a world without unnecessary suffering. We're already there. And so what are you doing here? Why are you writing? Oh, because I have to, it's what I have an impulse to do. I just have the need to do it. And it's like, I, I don't know about that. And once again, you're going to be competing against all the people who have fellowships and everyone else who thinks they can just write and not actually have to participate in the game of life. And I'll get more into actually how the solar solar art has been corrupted by politics in 2024 in a second, but enough from me. Let us get back from Ishima before I start going too crazy. I'm like, I feel like a Maserati in the garage right now. I want to start going, but this is a video about Mishima. So Mishima says, continuing about artists, I have Stephen King in my mind right now. The men who indulged in nocturnal thought it seemed to me, had without exception dry, lusterless skins and sagging stomachs. They sought to wrap up a whole epic or epoch, depending where you are in the English world, in a capacious night of ideas and rejected in all its forms the sun that I had seen. They rejected both life and death as I had seen them, for in both of these the sun had a hand. It was in 1952 on the deck of the ship on which I made my first journey abroad that I exchanged a reconciliatory, reconciliatory handshake with the sun. From that day on, I have found myself unable to part company with it. The sun became associated with the main highway of my life, and little by little, it tanned my skin brown, branding me as a member of the other race. One might object that thought belongs essentially to the night, that creation with words is of necessity carried out in the fevered darkness of night. Indeed, I had still not lost my old habit of working through the small hours, and I was surrounded by people whose skins unmistakably bore witness to nocturnal thinking. Yet why must it be that men always seek out the depths the abyss. Why must thought, like a plumb line, concern itself exclusively with vertical descent? Why was it not feasible for thought to change direction and climb vertically up, ever up, towards the surface? Why should the area of the skin, which guarantees a human being's existence in space, be most despised and let to the, left to the tender mercies of the senses? I could not understand the laws governing the motion of thought, the way it was liable to get stuck in unseen chasms whenever it set out to go deep or where, wherever it aimed at the heights to soar away into boundless and equally invisible heavens, leaving the corporeal form undeserved, undeserved, undeservedly neglected. I'm sorry. And Mishima is spitting absolute fire here, everybody. And this is what I have been saying. People hate the word transcendent. People hate the, the climb upward because it's going to affect everyone else around you. You are going to become, yes, I said, better than the people around you. Oh, people aren't better than other people. We're all the same. The janitor who cleans up our shit. He's a human being too. Yeah, obviously, you fucking idiot. I understand that. But we got to go beyond that. Oh my God, we all have experiences. We all have our own truths. I understand. But you have a duty to not be the janitor. For the love of God, the janitor doesn't know that he there is a transcendent quality and he can hit the solar heights of art you are here watching a booktube channel when you could be watching mr beast do a scripted video you could be watching the kansas city swifties script right now and enjoying yourself and just 
TikToking yourself into oblivion, but you're not. And so it's your job to wake those people up. It's your job to help them because yes, at this moment in time, you are better and they can have an awakening too and get to your level. I don't sit here and say, well, I'm also a very good athlete, but you know, I can deadlift 400 pounds, and so Kobe's not better than me. He just has realized himself more of an athlete. It's only with intellectual stuff. It's only when it's money and intellectual stuff that people start getting all insecure about what they haven't done in life. We are stunted. We are literally stuck in the mud right now. When I read people's stuff, I see, I read a lot of your guys' stuff that you guys send me, and some of it's great, but a lot of it is literally stuck. It, we, it's like, oh my God, have you guys, it's, it's like his analogy is almost literal. Have you guys been outside? Have you done anything? Have you experienced anything? higher states of consciousness consciousness before, whether by a near-death experience, drugs, meditation, love, um, what poverty. Um, well, I don't know. Have you guys done it? Or, or are you guys, do you think that this is good? And I'm not sitting here saying I'm the best writer of all time, but that's where I'm trying to go. That's what I'm trying to do. That's why in my book that I'm going to be releasing soon, I translated Rilke. That's why I tried to bring someone who I feel is one of the most transcendent authors of all time, because maybe right now at this period of my life in my early thirties, maybe I'm not there yet. Maybe I'm not the greatest. So I'm going to give praise and I'm going to give space to one of the greatest and make sure by the time you guys finish my book that you guys got at least something transcendent. And that's something that we don't do anymore either. We don't translate other authors. We don't praise other people. What is praise other than a solar vertical ascent toward bringing light to something important. What is that? Why? (laughs) We live in the nocturnal world. What do you think all the little Reddit kids are doing right now? They are in their little nocturnal hollow with these emotions and these thoughts that mean nothing because no one cares. It's just going into an endless void. Look at what you could even see when Mishima's running, you know, to soar away into the boundless and equally invisible heavens, leaving the corporeal form undeservedly neglected. That's what we are doing. That's what the night is doing. We just leave our form. We are leaving this body. But you, in 2024, got to get up. Literally, you have to stand up. You have to go out into the world and say, I'm a writer. I'm the best writer in the world. I am doing it. Even if you suck at writing, we need people. Oh my God, like writers are in... (laughs) Writers and a lot of people today are the most annoying people in the world. They will do anything other than writing something that soars and shines and then speak about it. We will do anything to live in our hollow little grave and write our little stories and complain and be weak. Once again, back to the axiomatic question, what are you doing? Why are are you here? Is it just to listen passively or is it to do something? You don't need to write the greatest novel of all time. You just need to shine light and on onto things in the world and the you you have to do it people are going to call you a narcissist they're going to say oh you only care about yourself and this is all i don't know what they're going to say but it's going to you know people who are unactivated who are nocturnal don't understand the solar and don't worry i've been in the nocturnal i've lived there for years if not dec over a decade of my life i love it i'm sure you love it this channel, you know, when I made 200 plus videos, and I only got 100 subscribers and 10,000 views total. I was making those videos at three in the morning. I was just spaced out, not caring. And then when I started waking up early, 5 a.m., going out into the world, actually doing something, suddenly the channel blew up. That's the same with art. That's the same with relationships. All the little sad boys out there, you know how good of boyfriends they are or girlfriends? They suck. No one wants to be with them. They're always complaining. They're always weak. Oh my God. They don't suffer in silence. They suffer by going, Mew, Mew, my dad, he was such a bad man. Oh my God. <laughs> Come on. Do what? Dude, it's so easy. Once you're out in the solar world, All your old problems are so easy to overcome. It's like that. It's like, I have a purpose. I have a mission. Like who gives a shit what happened? I I, let's go. And maybe if you take it too far, maybe you try to, you know, do something revolutionary and cut yourself open like Mishima did, but we aren't necessarily programmed in that manner. Like Mishima, I'm not a schizophrenic advocating that we need to make artistic statements like that, but my God. If David Foster Wallace, instead of hanging himself like a sad boy, and I love you, David, don't worry. But if David Foster Wallace sat and tried to overtake uh, a military base and committed seppuku uh, while holding infinite jest in his hand, damn, I would have a lot more respect for him. 
<laughs> we, that would be that'd be like damn bro and if he was saying up there like none of you guys you guys have all been lost to irony in south park all you guys suck like what the hell is this shit man all this shit i'm reading like i'd be like okay bro let's go that would that so maybe maybe i'm wrong but hey speaking of capitalism and the solar journey. If you are a solar individual who has money and time to join my Mishima book club, we are about to start reading over on the Right Conscious Book Club four different Mishima novels. And as you see, they are at different times on different days of the week. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you will be able to make one of these Mishima book clubs. And if you can't, for whatever reason, the Right Conscious Book Club is also doing 16 other book clubs that are starting very soon, which makes us the most active book club in the world. But there, but wait, there is more. You will also get access to podcasts that are exclusive to Substack. For instance, there's some on Mishima. Here's one on Yushio Mishima's Seppuku and the philosophy behind it. I plan to do a ton more Mishima content that is much more niche over there. Literally right before this video, I was making another video on Mishima but it was just too meta. I was like, oh my God. We we're literally talking about like these crazy incidents in Japan and I have to explain the history of it for 20 minutes. So I'm gonna put that over on the Substack because not everyone is interested in Japanese history like you and I probably are if you've made it this far in this video. But you will also get access to office hours with me where you can come talk to me, hear me go crazy. Sometimes I'm acting even crazier than this in the office hours and crazy stuff happens. Um, and a bunch of other cool stuff. If you want to join, the link is down in the description below. And let us keep going with a quote from Mishima because I am not done yet. The sun was enticing, almost dragging my thoughts away from the, their night of visceral sensations, away to the swelling of muscles encased in sunlit skin. And it was commanding me to construct a new and sturdy dwelling in which my mind, as it rose little by little to the surface, could live in security. That dwelling was a tan, lustrous skin and powerful, sensitively rippling muscles. Ooh. I came to feel that it was precisely because such an adobe was required that Adobe, excuse me, <laughs> was required that the average intellectual failed to feel at home with the thought that concerned itself with forms and surfaces. The nocturnal outlook, product of diseased inner organs, is given shape almost before its owner is aware which came first. The outlook itself or the first faint morbid symptoms in the inner organs. And yet, in remote recesses invisible to the eye, the bodily, body slowly creates and regulates its own thought. With the surface, on the other hand, which is visible to everybody, training of the body must take precedence over training of thought if it is to create and supervise its own ideas. And I wonder what we could do with more of a solar approach. There is a famous now deceased postmodernist author named Roberto Bolaño. We're actually reading this one books, one of his books over in the book club. And back in the day, he was uh, in Mexico. They used to storm these nocturnal kind of confessional poets readings. And they would, they, he had this group and they called themselves the Inferialists. And they wanted to have this like aggressive, beautiful prose and poetry and mentality toward art that wasn't focused on kind of like just making money and like getting the university position. These guys were scumbags. They were like doing drugs and their teeth were all messed up. And like, you know, the kind of the classic depiction of the artist that wasn't an aristocrat. And at these poetry readings, they would just get up and start talking shit. They'd be like, you suck, bro. Like, what is wrong with you? And we are so polite now that no one does that at a rupee car reading. No one does that at a Tracy K. Smith meeting. Tracy K. Smith was the poet, the poet, uh, the, the poet laureate of the United States like a couple of years ago. And I saw her speak. We all sat there respectively. But she wrote, I, she read a nature poem that day. And I swear to God, I mean, I will stand behind this objectively. I had a student last year at the age of 14 years old who never wrote a poem in her life. And after working on poetry for a couple weeks, she wrote a better poem than the poet laureate of the United States. I would die on that grave. And I've seen plenty of other people. My wife writes a better nature poem every single day than the poet laureate of the, the former poet laureate of the United States. And it's not just us. I mean, I could just go on for days. There's hundreds of authors because nature poetry is actually what I'm most versed in, that I know who've done better than her. Same with Joy Harjo, who's actually, I think, maybe the current poet laureate or very soon before. And I actually like Joe Harjo's stuff. Um, she has some good books and I appreciate what she's done. But they are literally political shells 
that are the perfect person to be the poet laureate. They are not going to rock the boat. They're not going to say anything. They're going to talk about Palestine and a couple other things and act like that's edgy. Like that's not edgy, you guys. You want to talk about political activism? You want to talk about creating change in the world? How about the transformation of the inner soul of the suburban people of America who are sleepwalkers? You know how crazy that would be? That is the real revolution. But these individuals are stuck. Once you get into the university, once, um, and I guess I can talk about this now. So there has kind of been a trend toward kind of this solar attitude where people like the youth poet, Amanda Gordon, who wrote, read her poem at the presidential inauguration and people like lost their mind. And I was like, oh my God, this is like terrible. Once again, I have students who are better than this, but they serve a political means. And this could be on the left or the right, but obviously the universities have been co-opted completely by the left. And the same with many other like artistic institutions, including public publishing houses across the country. And so real artists, real poets actually rock the boat and have crazy opinions. For instance, one of the most impactful American poets of all time, Robert Bly, won um, the National Book Award for his poetry book, The Light Around the Body. And it was a protest book against the Vietnam War. And it's talk about political poetry is way better than anything I've ever read in terms of political poems, like beautiful. And he gave that money away from the award to like veterans of the Vietnam War who were like disabled or something. But in the 1990s, Robert Bly started talking about how the feminist movement and how technology and the modern culture had ruined men and men were basically losing their place in the world and we were all going to be turned into women and all of the people that gave him the awards, all the people that gave him accolades for decades, he ran the great mother conference which promoted, you know, the more pagan aspects of femininity. This guy who had been lifted up by the left forever, once he started talking about men and the family becoming lost, became public enemy number one. New York Times articles putting hit pieces on him and yada, yada, yada. Once Robert Bly stepped out into the light, that's what happened. For a long time, he lived more in these nocturnal shadows and he would come out and actually do political poetry. That was impactful. But he was an artist that didn't have a set of standards that made sense because that's what real artists are. When people freak out about J.K. Rowling, J.K. Rowling is, in my account, from what I could tell, a pretty leftist individual, but she believes that there are only two genders and now she is public enemy number one. And so if you look at all these poets, all these authors that have been pushed on us, they are living in this fake solar world that's been created by their nocturnal kind of artistic prowess, we could say, or lack of prowess, and they have all similar views. It's not like Joy, Joy Harjo is going to come out and be like, hey, I'm voting for Donald Trump, or hey, I actually don't support abortion. They would never do that because they are actually political weapons, and you can only get to that level, and I, will, I can say the same thing about the right and things that they do. You can't get to the top of the conservative or Republican party and be like, hey, Christianity is fake. Hey, you guys are crazy. You guys need to calm down a little bit. But like I said, a lot of the artists, a lot of the writers that we're talking about are more on that side. So that the topic is a little bit more relevant. And so that is our job as artists to actually have incongruent thoughts and feelings. We maybe this might sound this might be even more mind blowing. We might need to have prejudice prejudices. We might need to say things that are not socially acceptable or feel things that are not socially acceptable because it's come from a place within and we aren't censoring ourselves. We aren't hurting anybody. We're not calling for anybody to be hurt, but we maybe have incongru an incongruent reality because that's what art is. My God, that's what the solar existence is. It is action. It is moving out into the world and not sitting and thinking and hiding, but becoming and, uh, and a sense of realization and manifestation. And a lot of the time that is sloppy and not perfect. And this whole process has been once again subverted because all the little pathways now have been kind of upheld. So it's like, okay, you believe in these political things, but also the sexual expression. Like, oh, now everything sexual is now allowed. But sex and all that is a very lunar thing. Once again, these things that are being promoted on us are very lunar. And on the solar journey and the transcendent journey, you are actually reaching for higher states of consciousness. And when you look at what sex has become in America and across the world, including in Japan, it's actually a negative. It's actually a dump of energy and you're not actually gaining transcendence. I'm not sitting here and saying, hey, we all need to engage in brahmacharya or um, retention of seminal fluids and not orgasm, but there actually is higher states of sexual connection that most of the time can only be achieved with a willing partner that you spend a significant amount of time with. That's not being discussed because the monogamous, the monogamous partner and the nuclear family has been imploded. But that is where a lot of the solar action and a lot of solar thought and consciousness always tends toward. 
because you want to create, you want, I mean, that is at some of the highest degree of creation is creating children, creating a family and creating the next generation and doing your part. Because right now, all these nocturnal beings, all these nocturnal individuals who've given up on the solar acquisition of an artistic life and the classic values of life, what have they done? They are not having kids anymore. Or the kids they are having are just, they're screwing them up. I have a friend right now and he's not religious, he's not a leftist, but him among many other people just ignore their kids. They play video games, they engage in this nocturnal stuff, they're addicted to porn, they're addicted to marijuana or to alcohol, and they are engaged in the brooding, they're engaged in the negative vertical descent or horizontal thought. And to break free from that is what our goal is here on Right Conscious to create a literary renaissance. So are you with me? Can we do this? I believe in you. I, I can feel right now you wherever you are at, and I can feel that in, that potential in there. And you have my permission. Look at me. I'm out here doing it. I have a job. I have a family. I have responsibilities. But you shouldn't be scared. You should be courageous. Learn the nocturnal world. Don't get caught up in the fake pseudo-capitalistic solar acquisition game or the pseudo-political game. But your own journey to the heights of the optical illumination of yourself and of the world and the most beautiful things in it is the most important journey that you can take, not just for you, but for your family and for others. So I applaud you if you were going to do that. If you were going to stay in the nocturnal night, hey, you're going to have a sagging stomach. You're going to be a little, you're going to be a little soyed out and it's more room for us to create and you're going to be playing catch up years later when you realize that we were right. So thank you guys for being here and I will see you guys in the next video.